So let's talk about the term helicopter parenting, which is an overused term, but it's really not a present parent. It's an anxious parent. And sometimes it's an aggressive and intrusive parent. Yeah, the, the people yelling at the side of the, the little league yeah. game going so nuts. So that's not being there any more than being there. I mean, in other words, if you're not there there at all and you're there intrusively, it can be experienced by children in the same way as you not being there. So it's like, I don't want you here. I have a theory. I'll share my theory with you, is that we have reversed things. This is how I think about it, because it's a very complicated thing, what we're talking about. It's not simple and it's nuanced. So we have adultomorphized young children, and then we have turned slightly older children into infants. We've reversed it. We want to treat our infants as infants and be there. And then we want to start incrementally letting our children explore. It's not any different than when they're little. If you go to nursery school or you go to the playground and you hover over them, that's not being present. Being present is space. It's giving them space. It's being there if they need you, if they're in distress, smiling at them t- so they know that they can, you have faith that they can play and that they'll be okay. You know, the glass floor experiment. Uh, years ago, there was an experiment where a mother was on one side of a glass floor with a big precipice underneath, a clear glass floor. The baby's on the other side. If the mother looked at the baby with a smile and faith in that baby, the baby toddled over the glass floor, which is a very scary glass floor, right? You know, objectively. But if the mother looked at the baby with anxiety, that baby broke down and cried and could not cross that floor. Hmm. So the concept, the concept is being in the playground and looking at your child slightly from afar with some space and say, go ahead, it's okay, you're okay and even letting them fall down every once in a while. But when they do, you meet their distress. You go and comfort them and soothe them. That's being present. Hovering over them is not being present. So in a way, we treat them as little old men and old women when they're little, and then we infantilize them when they're older. We have to reverse it if we want to get this thing right, which is letting them have, as you say, circles of exploration is how they grow. So let's talk now about this next phase, which is graduating high school, but you're still technically adolescent, I guess. Yeah, you are. Um, so this is the phase my son is entering into. He's 18. Yeah. And out into 25. So that's college. That's the start of your career, um, maybe in that order or maybe one or the other. What is happening psychologically and, and, and neurologically in that phase and then and then we can talk about what do we as parents do. Well, they're breaking down when they leave home. And a lot of that... What does that mean when you say they're breaking down? Oh, literally, they're having mental breakdowns. They're getting so depressed or anxious or suicidal. So are you saying you're, you're, you're describing what's happening, not what should happen? Yes, that's what's happening. Not bre- which, definitely not what okay. should happen, but it yeah. is what's happening. They've come out of what didn't used to be a stressful period. And I can just use myself. I'm almost 60 years old. And when I was in high school, it was not stressful. I think I took the SAT once. I didn't do great on it. Oh, well, I got into whatever college I got into. I had a bunch of Bs and B minuses. I think I even had a C on my report card. I played a lot. You could be like the Nathan Fielder opening sequence. I I graduated from a school with pretty good grades. Pretty good grades, that's right. A, A minus B. (laughs) I mean, you know, because high school was meant to be a time of balance. And I went to college and I discovered my academic, you know, affinity when I got to college. And I even transferred to a better college. And so it wasn't really a pressured experience. I didn't come from a pressured experience. I didn't go into a pressured experience. I just had experiences. And that's what it used to be. It's not like that anymore. Because what we've done is, again, in treating young children as as adults, we've pressured them at a very young age to be accomplished. We've given them a sense of the future and their future selves before they're ready to see their future selves. I wasn't ready to look at my future self or worry about meaningful work when I was in high school. I couldn't have dealt with the pressure uh, of taking exams five times to get perfect scores so I could get into the perfect school. We're basically 
teaching them from a very young age that they have to have resumes, they have to have internships, and they have to have perfect scores and perfect grades, or they're not going to get into a good college, they're not going to get a good job, they're not going to have a good life. I mean, this is parental anxiety. Yeah. 100%. And this is educational institutional anxiety. So we are causing our children's anxiety. I go back to where is it coming from? It is not innate in these children. We are indoctrinating them into a system that is not working. And I don't know when someone's going to pull the plug on it. What do we understand right now about what is happening? What is, what is happening, not socially, um, as a diagnosis of the, our problems, but yeah. in their, in, in naturally, like in their brains from 18 to 25. And what, what, what does healthy look like? So remember I said that middle adolescence was very present oriented. 18 to 25 is when they start to be able to envision the future, but it's just the beginning. It's like just the beginning of being able to look into the future and say, maybe I could be a ballerina. Maybe I could be, uh, you know, an accountant. Maybe I could be a fireman. Maybe, you know, it's just the beginning. But what we're doing to them is we're making them declare, right? You're going to be a doctor. You're going to get on a pre-med path. And their brains can't cope with the stress. That's what's happening. We are imposing so much stress on their developing brains that they can't take it. You could call it short circuiting is what's happening to them. And so they're turning to things like alcohol and drugs with it. That's another piece of it. The potency of drugs is, I mean, THC levels in cannabis in my generation were two to four percent. So it wasn't addictive. It wasn't poisonous. It wasn't, you know, you didn't have breakdowns from it. It didn't induce psychopathy or whatever. <laughs> or depersonalization. So what's happening is because they're so stressed, they're turning to drugs. So even it's a kind of self-medication, isn't it? It is self-medication. They're turning to drugs even more than alcohol. Alcohol is also a problem. But drugs have become... Is that statistically true? I thought Gen Z was sort of down on all the sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Nope. That they were the boring generation. No, no, no. Drug, drug use is up and cannabis use is really up. And now that it's being legalized, even more legitimized. But the idea is that the cannabis use is responsible for a lot of the suicidality that we're seeing. And we're, it's not being advertised, but 39% of the emergency room visits for mental health reasons are because of cannabis poisoning, because really? of uh -huh, because of either depersonalizations or a psychotic break. And some of those psychotic breaks mean that they have to drop out of school. A lot of them mean that they are hospitalized and they stay in hospitals for six months to two years. And we're not talking about it. It's really interesting that we're not talking about it. And I think it's counterculture to talk about depressurizing children. It's counterculture to talk about why are they using the drugs they're using? Because they're using it to, to self-medicate because they're stressed out of their minds. It's so funny. One of the pressurizing factors with college now is it's so damn expensive. Yeah. Unless you, I mean, unless you go to the in-state school and even then it's like, it can be pretty darn expensive. And they know it too. Remember the, the adolescent brain is also incredibly binary. So if they're not an absolute success in their minds and perfect, then they're an absolute failure. There's nothing in between. And so, yes, the money also has to do with the pressure. So what's your advice for the parent who's come to this conversation? Their kids are eight, their kid is 18. They're, they're thinking to themselves, man, I did a lot of, I did a lot of this stuff that I shouldn't have done, but I want to change. Yeah. Can I change now? Can I, what, what's, so let's start there. It's Where like, there's life, my, there's hope. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I've done my best, but clearly my, my child is nervous. They're super stressed out. I've probably, maybe I've focused on success in these metrics too much, but I can change. Help me change. Pull the plug, pull the plug on the pressure and be aware, self-awareness is the key. If you're aware as a parent that your anxiety over your child being successful. I mean, again, remember that all of this, for the most part, comes from a very good place in parents because they love their children and they want them to be successful and they define success 
as getting into the best school and getting the best job and making the most money and having the most stuff and being self-aware enough to redefine that with your children. Start to have talks, have good open communication and talk about what success means and talk about some of the mistakes you've made and talk about even the mistakes in giving your child the impression that success was driven by good grades and excellence in academics and sports and that actually Success is mental health. Success is balance. Success is happiness. Success is relationships. That's success. And in the end, the child who makes it for the long haul is the child who is, as you say, the one who's more balanced and happier. And so redefining success as a parent and then reinforcing that, re really reinforcing it, but being aware that you can say the right thing but underneath feel something different. So you have to get into alignment, your deep feelings with your words. Because if you just say the right, I have a lot of parents that come to see me for parent guidance who say the right things, but deeply they still feel terribly anxious about their child getting, in, getting the right scores, getting into the good school. And it takes a lot of, you know, metaphorically massaging their shoulders to get them to calm down so they can calm their children down. If you like this clip, you should check out the full video and all the other great content we've got at Dad Saves America. So be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and ring that bell so you won't miss our new stuff as it drops each week.